Um, I, I came across an excellent, excellent, I mean, really an excellent paper um, in the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy, in the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy, written by one of my favorite economists, living economists, uh, John Cochran, and he has a co-author, Amit Seru. Uh, Amit Seru is uh, at the uh, Stanford Graduate Business School. It looks like, I don't know, maybe he's a... Um, Maybe he's a graduate student because I, I don't think, I don't see. Yeah, I don't know if he's a professor. I don't know. It's weird that it doesn't give his kind of credentials. Uh, but anyway, uh, he is at uh, Stanford Graduate Business School. Maybe he's a professor there. Um, it, the article is called Ending Bailouts at Last. Um, it's excellent. It's, um, uh, it's in the, as I said, it's, it's published, formally published in the Journal of Law and Econ Economics and Policy, but you can get it in PDF form, so you can download it. It's not blocked and not hidden behind uh, some uh, paywall that is inaccessible. Um, and I think you can even increase the font so you can actually read the thing. Oops, I increased it too much. Anyway, uh, I want to go over. I want to go over the um, uh, you know the story that the paper tells. Uh, John Cochran is a interesting economist in that he, uh, a lot of his work is very mathematical, uh, full of models, full of math, uh, super interesting, uh, even when it's mathematical, but hard to follow because it's super hard. But he's also good at storytelling. He's also get, he tells a good story. That is, he's also good at writing papers that don't have any math and that just tell a good story. This is an example of the second. This is a this is a paper with no math, no numbers, no equations, uh, no calculus, uh, none of that needed. And I encourage anybody interested in the history of uh, banking, interested in bailouts, interested in what actually happens in bailouts, and interested in the solution, at least in a solution proposed by Cochrane, which I think, given where we are in the world today, I would take that solution like that. Not my ideal, not my preferred solution, not my ideal solution, but better, better than I think uh, uh, anything anybody else is proposing um, out there that's doable, that's doable, even though I, his solution, unfortunately, even Cochrane's solution is not very doable. So I want to, I want to take you through a history uh, of bailouts, a history of the United States bailing companies out, bailing primarily banks out. Most of bailouts in history have, have been uh, of banks. Uh, and really, uh, you know, before the 1980s, before the 1980s, the United States government did not really bail out financial institutions, certainly not at scale. And, and I can't really think of any major bailout. There were a lot of financial crises. Hundreds of banks closed and shuttered. Uh, in some cases, uh, before the establishment of the Fed, uh, private bankers bailed out other banks in all kinds of structured deals in order to stabilize the market out of their own self-interest. And indeed, uh, that was how finance existed for much of the 19th century, early, very early 20th century. And uh, we can, you know, this isn't the place maybe to talk about why those, uh, why all those banking crises happened um, uh, during the 19th century. Uh, but it basically has to do with banking regulations and, and the dabbling of the US government, even back then when it didn't have a Federal Reserve, the United States government could not stop itself from, uh, from dabbling in uh, monetary policy and basically determining the value of money uh, and, uh, and playing around with silver and gold and buying and selling and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, providing liquidity to the market, not providing liquidity to the market. Uh, because of the, uh, the Federal Reserve was established in, in 1914, and of course we had the great economic crash, the, the, the the uh, stock market crash in 1929 that, again, not the place or the time to go into, but because of government policies and Fed policies led to a massive uh, 
uh, Depression, which uh, kind of peaked in 1933 with hundreds of banks going bankrupt, hundreds of banks going bankrupt, people losing their savings. There was no deposit insurance in those days, and people did lose everything they owned in, in the banks. As a consequence of that, the, the federal government passed a series of regulations that established all kinds of regulations on banks, and on, they, they created saving and loans and regulations of saving and loans uh, institutions. And those regulations basically still are still, for the most part, they've been tinkered with, but for the most part have um, survived to this day. But the government didn't get into the business of, other than paying out when a bank failed, deposit insurance to the accounts that were covered under deposit insurance, didn't get into the business of wholesale bailouts of financial institutions and other institutions until the early 1980s, until, surprisingly enough, uh, the Reagan administration. Not only was Chrysler bailed out with a loan from the government, but much more importantly and much more consequentially, I think, in the end, uh, 19, in 1984, the United States uh, experienced the largest bank failure in its history, uh, a bank called Continental Illinois, fa Illinois failed. And basically, the reason it failed and the reason hundreds of SNLs failed in the 1980s and early 1990s is because of, to some extent, what we're experiencing right now, but, but worse. Because on the one hand, government was regulating at the time interest rates, not just interest rates that banks could lend and borrow from each other, but also interest rates that banks could lend to us and had to pay us for, for pay us for the deposits we put in there, in our checking accounts, but also because of inflation. Inflation basically caused the banks to have to pay on their deposits more and more money, but the loans were fixed. Many of them had mortgages that were long dated. The federal government had granted uh, the uh, banking system deposit insurance and in 1980, I think it was 1980, raised it to 100,000, which was an absurd amount. You know, $100,000 was a lot of money. And they raised it to $100,000. And when you guarantee banks credit, which is what deposit is, when you, when you put your money into a bank in a checking account, you're basically lending money to the bank. And so you're credited to the bank. And what the government is sell telling you when you give the money to the bank is we will guarantee you a downside. The bank will pay you interest, and indeed sometimes very high interest, but you'll never lose your, you'll never lose your money because the government will always step in as long as you have below whatever threshold it is. We will guarantee your losses. This has been in place since the 1930s, since the 1930s. Uh, since the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, 1930s regulation of the banking system that FDR put in place, and of course what that encourages banks to do is, hey guys, give me a lot of money, and then the bank will turn around and make really really risky bets with that money, particularly as it's approaching bankruptcy, it's got nothing to lose. Shareholders are going to be wiped out anyway. Shareholders are going to go to zero anyway when they get to bankruptcy. But if they make really, really risky loans and some of them pay out, they might be able to escape from bankruptcy, save shareholders. And if they don't escape bankruptcy, if they go into bankruptcy because of the risky loans, shareholders are still wiped out. And the people who really suffer in the bankruptcy are there other creditors, the long-term creditors, the long-term bonds that maybe have been given to the bank when they raise capital? Deposit as a whole, because they get the money from the government. Shareholders lose everything, but they were going to lose everything anyway. So companies, as they approach bankruptcy, have an ever-increasing incentive to take on more and more risk with basically free money, money they pay a lot for, but money that has no downside risk. So in the Wall Street Journal in the 1980s, they used to publish this list of the banks offering the highest interest rates on insured deposits. 
And all those banks were banks that were about to go bankrupt. These generally were SNLs, saving and loan banks. Because as they approached bankruptcy, they started uh, trying to suck up as much money from depositors as possible and make big, risky bets with that money. Anyway, Continental Illinois failed in 1984. It was deemed at the time the first bank ever to be too big to fail. The bank had lost a huge amount of money on bad loans, particularly loans for things like oil exploration. And the FDIC seized the bank. The Fed came in. Um, they, but they bailed out everybody. They didn't allow anybody except shareholders to take a loss. They bailed out not only the insured depositors, the people who were promised deposit insurance, which they had to do, but also uninsured deposits. People who had more than $100,000 in the bank were bailed out. And on top of that, bondholders who had no formal protection were bailed out. And really, this was the first big bailout, really, in American history. And it set the tone and the trend uh, for the future in terms of, in terms of bailouts. Uh, during the 1980s, hundreds of SNLs, you know, failed. But uh, the government and the government had to spend, uh, you know, a lot of money to bail out the insured deposits. The SNLs were not deemed, right, were not deemed to, um, um, you know, uh, uh, were not deemed to uh, be too big to fail. So it, it was interesting what happened during this period of time. Well, during this period of time, uh, early on, uh, the SNLs were allowed to stay open, even though they were technically bankrupt, under the idea that they might grow out of it. They might somehow become whole again. Of course, they'd only dug them deeper and caused the FDIC, the Deposit Insurance Fund, to take on even more debts. Uh, when that didn't work, regulators started shutting down banks even before, even before they were formally bankrupt. Indeed, shareholders sued uh, the government for that and actually won the lawsuit, saying that they, their banks shouldn't have been shut down. There was no reason to shut them down. So during this period, uh, the FDIC was paying out, but the banks were not bailed out whole. That is, you did not have a situation where these SNLs were being, um, uh, were, uh, what do you call it, uh, where uninsured depositors and where bondholders were being bailed out. Hundreds of banks failed. Insured depositors got their money, cost, cost taxpayers in the end. $124 billion to settle up with all the SNLs that were shut down uh, during this period. Uh, you know, uh, uh, banks in the United States, I think the big banks in particular, uh, looking at what happened at Continental Illinois, uh, made a lot of big loans to Latin American countries that were offering very high interest rates. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, under this, e even though they're very high risk, basically under the assumption that, um, uh, that the U.S. government would bail them out, an assumption that turned out to be true, uh, the United States basically bailed out Mexico uh, in the 1980s uh, and uh, early 19, uh, in the 1980s, bailed out Mexico. And it really wasn't a bailout of Mexico, if you really think about it. They provided a lot of money for Mexico so that Mexico could pay Citibank, you know, basically repay the bonds. So basically the federal government bailed out Citibank in the 1980s by bailing out the Mexican government and by encouraging the IMF, funded to a large extent by the U.S., to, uh, bail out, um, to bail out other Latin American countries. Uh, and that was a way of bailing out Wall Street. It was a way of bailing out the big banks indirectly. Again, every bailout like this, what does it do? It creates something called moral hazard. It basically tells 
the bank, you can take on as much risk as you want. The downside is capped. You can benefit all you want from the risk taking. You can take all the upside. You can get all the benefits from what you're doing. But when you fail, we'll bail you up. Well, that's exactly what happened. Banks became riskier and riskier and riskier. Uh, this happened in the 1980s with Latin America. It then happened in the 90s. And a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, banks and, and uh, uh, financial institutions got into trouble with the Asian financial crisis. Uh, in 1998, a big hedge fund, long-term capital management, uh, took a huge loss uh, on Russian government bonds, Russian government bonds, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this is during the Russian financial crisis that followed the Asian financial crisis. And uh, the New York Fed basically put together a consortium of firms and bailed them out. Right? All this really led up to 2008, the mother of all bailouts, if you will. In 2008, all that risky behavior that companies were engaging in for decades under the assumption that they would be bailed out, that they would be protected, came to fruition. Banks would be doing a lot of stupid things. Now, it, I don't think banks doing stupid things is what caused the financial crisis. Uh, we can, you know, you can take my course on, on the causes of the financial crisis that's on YouTube and listen to that if you're interested in it. But the reality is that banks took on huge amount of financial risk. And the government basically bailed them all out. The Fed offered, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Fed basically completely, the U.S. government completely bailed out Bear Stearns. So the creditors wouldn't take any losses. The federal, the Fed then offered $12.9 billion in loans to facilitate the merger between Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan Chase. This is in early 2008. And then it offered $28.82 billion to, uh, to help purchase the assets of Bear Stearns. In September 2008, the Treasury Department offered almost $200 billion to Freddie and Fannie Mac to keep them solvent. And then, if you remember, the US government took temporary control of AIG, a large insurance company, deemed too big to fail. And the Fed offered a $141.8 billion fund in exchange for 92% of AIG ownership. The fact that Lehman Brothers failed a day before AIG was bailed out uh, is one of the great mysteries of the financial crisis. Why was Lehman Brothers allowed to fail when everybody else was bailed out? You know, the, those who, like um, Wall Street feuds, would argue that it's because pretty much everybody who was making a decision about this was a former banker at Goldman Sachs, Lehman's hated rival, and had no interest in bailing out Lehman's, maybe. But the reality is that Lehman Brothers, they couldn't cut a deal. They couldn't find a way to bail them out. They tried for a number of days, and when that failed, they basically let them go, right? But then, when Lehman Brothers failed, and there was this fear that the banking system would collapse, the Treasury Department then raised, what was it, $700 billion to inject capital, inject capital <laughs> into large banks and buy so-called toxic assets. But they landed up injecting capital into all banks, whether they wanted it or not, whether they liked it or not. And at the same time, during this period in the post-Lehman Brothers, era. They landed up giving loans to car companies, GM and Chrysler, uh, that were in danger of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, 
Uh, they bailed them out, but it turned out that the Fed had the discount window open to all kinds of companies, uh, G Capital, lots of companies to prevent. So in other words, in 2008, bailout was the key word. Everybody, everybody who got into financial problems during 2008, big companies that were big companies, not, not small companies, and every little teeny itsy bitsy bank, ever, all of them, were basically bailed out in one way or another. Now, almost all these bailouts were in the form of loans and capital infusions, and then all the money came back, and the government made money on pretty much all these deals. Doesn't change the fact that creditors who should have been wiped out, that's how markets work. You make a bad loan, they can't pay you back, you're wiped out, should have been wiped out, we're not. Now, the response to this was Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is an act that was passed in 2020, 2010. It's called the Financial Oversight, Stability Oversight. And it established the Financial Stability Oversight Council and to oversee financial stability and to oversee too big to fail firms. It also created the Consumer Financial, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which we talked about uh, in the context of uh, the, um, in the context of the Supreme Court uh, decision about whether we've got constitutional or not. Anyway, Dodd-Frank was supposed to, I mean, and this is how it was presented, it was the, supposed to be the bill that ends bailouts. It was the bill that would provide us with financial stability and end bailouts forever. And it was going to fix all the problems in the American financial system. Arguably, it did exactly the opposite. In, uh, the bill was passed in 2010, exactly 10 years later, in 2020, COVID hit. We all know the response to COVID, uh, shutting down and all of that. But COVID was an opportunity for the government to basically go into a bailing everybody out mode. And they bailed everybody out. This was the mother of all bailouts. Banks were bailed out. Small businesses, you remember PPP loans, were bailed out. Uh, institutions, uh, you know, uh, small businesses, big businesses, uh, individuals were bailed out. We all got stimulus checks in the mail. Everybody, everybody got a check from the government. It was the largest bailout in human history. And nobody batted an eye. Nobody seemed to care. Like, Dodd-Frank was supposed to prevent this. Why were banks, given a pandemic, in such financial precarious position so as to go bust? Why did they need a bailout? Uh, you can make an argument about private individuals and, and uh, small businesses. They need a bailout because of the monstrous authoritarian dictates of the government preventing people from going to work or from going outside, just generally. But why, oh why, did banks need a bailout when Dodd-Frank was supposed to have protected all that? So we got the mother of all bailouts. And again, nobody batted an eye. Nobody asked the question, well, wait a minute, why didn't Dodd-Frank work? And maybe nobody asked the question because the answer was, well, look, it was COVID and it was this extraordinary situation and it was just bizarre and it was weird. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really unexplained and it's all COVID. It's, COVID fo it's, co it's COVID's fault. But then how do you explain Silicon Valley Bank? Silicon Valley Bank took a risk that is very easy to, if you will, anticipate. Not an obscure risk. It did not involve uh, derivatives. It was not difficult to see. Basically, 
you know, a, a, a Silicon Valley bank had a lot of uninsured funds, primarily from startups, and had bought with those funds during COVID and just after COVID. You remember, venture capital went through the roof after COVID. There's all, venture capital funds had a lot of cash. They put it in the bank, a Silicon Valley bank. Silicon Valley bank suddenly had a lot of cash and it decided to use that cash. This is a period of 0% interest rates, not to buy the 0% short-term government bonds, uh, government treasuries, but to buy long-dated bonds, which makes sense because long-dated bonds were at least giving you 3 4% so that they could make a profit over that versus what they were paying depositors. And the risk there is, of course, that interest rates go up. When interest rates go up, now you've got a real problem because whatever loans you've made with this money or whatever uh, you know, loans, whatever bonds you bought will not reprice. It's fixed. Let's say you bought them and they were paying 3%. And now interest rates jump to five, you, you're basically losing two percent on the money. Now that's interest rate risk. That is banking 101. That is completely predictable. Why wasn't it hedged? Why wasn't it accounted for? Why was there such a mismatch between long-term uh, assets and short-term liabilities? Why was this going on? Where were the regulators? Where was Dodd-Frank? This is exactly what Dodd-Frank was supposed to save us from. This is exactly the kind of risks that Dodd-Frank was supposed to be able to predict. Wouldn't happen. Instead, Silicon Valley went under because there was a bank run, a bank run very similar to the ones in the 1930s, very similar to the ones in the 1930s. Uh, and the government didn't know what to do. Silicon Valley Bank is not a too big to fail bank. It's not a systemic bank. But the government was afraid of, quote, contagion. So they bailed them out. They didn't just bail out insured depositors, which is what deposit insurance does. They bailed out all the creditors to Silicon Valley Bank. The only people who lost any money were shareholders. The same thing happened a month later to First Republic. They bailed out everybody. Everybody was made whole. So what went wrong? Why did Dodd Frank not work? I mean, I know why it didn't work, but why didn't it work? Uh, anybody, is anybody thinking about this? Is anybody suggesting solutions how to prevent bank runs in the future? How to prevent bank from taking on these kind of risks? And this is not just bad management. This is inherent in the nature of banking today. Banks have massive leverage. They only have to keep, they have to keep very low reserves. They have very little capital. But that's by regulation. That's what they need to do. Banks are set up to fail. And the belief is, and they have moral hazard on top of that, to encourage them to take the risks that will bring about their failures. And the idea is, oh, don't worry, system, system out there, don't worry, because we have established a regulatory system. We have empowered regulatory bodies to oversee what they do, to oversee their behavior, and make sure they behave themselves, and make sure they don't fail. But that doesn't work. I mean, I don't know why anybody ever thought it would work. Anybody, anybody who knows anything about regulation would know that it wouldn't work. But it hasn't worked again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And yet nobody steps back and questions, OK, well, what do we do? How do we fix this? What they suggest is maybe more regulations. There's now Basel III, which is going to be a European and American big regulatory thing. By the way, uh, the Swiss bailed out uh, Credit Suisse. Everybody who was a creditor at Credit Suisse was basically bailed out. 
So it's not just a U.S. issue. And now they've got Basel III, which is just create more moral hazard in a system rife with moral hazard, with huge amounts of moral hazard, and a system that is structured in a way as to induce failure. If you're leveraged 9 to 1, which is what most banks are leveraged, it doesn't take much for you to fail. It doesn't take much for you to fail. And the incentives of shareholders and the incentives of managers are to take on risk at that level of leverage. That's already risk, just a leverage. Because, you know, because a lot of these banks are struggling anyway and might as well gamble. And if you lose, then at least the creditors, who are supposed to be the ones who really monitor you and prevent you from taking on crazy risks, they get bailed out. And we can go through why creditors control you in terms of not allowing you to take on crazy risk, if you want to. So um, we now have a situation where whatever regulatory system we have has completely failed. By their standards failed, not by my standards. My my standards failed a long time ago. By their standards, it has failed. And the response to this is not, let's rethink it. Let's change it a little bit. Let's tinker with it even. They're not doing anything. What they are doing is they're expanding its scope. Janet Yellen has just announced that uh, the Treasury Department now says that non-bank mortgage services are systematically important. And we are going to expand what's systemically important on and on. We've already bailed out Silicon Valley Bank, so basically any mid-sized bank in the United States is systemically important, and we need to bail them out. Now, you know, you can run this pyramid scheme if you want. You can run this scam... Because what does bailing out mean? Bailing out means you take on, the government basically monetizes huge amounts of debt, which is what they did during COVID, and distributes it, distributes the money. We suffered the consequence of that with inflation. Inflation is basically a consequence of the massive bailout of COVID. The fact that COVID, basically the Federal Reserve printed money in order to bail everybody out because they couldn't borrow it. There weren't enough people to lend money to the U.S. government. So they had to monetize it. They had to actually print the money to bail us all out. What happens when we get another 2008 and the government wants another trillion or 10 trillion, probably more like 10 trillion dollars, to bail out J.P. Morgan or Citibank or... or or Midwest banks and, 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 and the auto industry and whoever else, the auto industry is heading into trouble. You know that because we're now establishing tariffs to protect them. What happens when the government needs $10 trillion to bail us out next time? Well, we know now that if they just print it, we have inflation. But who's going to lend them $10 trillion? The government is running massive deficits. It has massive debt that nobody at this point thinks they can really repay. Again, who's going to lend us the money? Nobody will. So the only alternative is to inflate. And this time, the inflation will be much worse because the bailout risks being much bigger. Imagine, imagine China invading Taiwan. And the United States cutting off all trade relations with China. And the supply chain collapsing. And businesses spiraling out of control in the United States. Banks that have loans with those businesses losing those loans. Imagine the United States ramping up, needing to ramp up military production because it is, I don't know, guaranteed Taiwanese sovereignty and therefore wants to ramp up its navy. And even if it doesn't, China is now clearly a military threat and we need to ramp up military spending. And yet it has to bail out the economy because the economy is spiraling down 
because of the massive delinking that's happening all of a sudden. And the, 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 uh, again, the banking sector is suffering a huge blow. And of course, it's not just the United States. This is happening in Europe. It's happening to our Asian allies, Japan and South Korea, are panicked and hysterical and also losing huge because they are all very integrated into the Chinese economy. How does the U.S. manage this bailout? Where does the money come from? What happens to interest rates if they try to issue debt? How high do they get? I mean, this is the kind of event, and this is the kind of, because we built up an economy that is not resilient, that relies on the government to survive, that relies on government bailouts to exist, then the government is going to be at some point constrained in its ability to bail it out. From the SNL crisis in, in continental Illinois to bailing out the entire system in 2008 to bailing out the entire world in, um, in, in 2020 to bailing out a few regional banks in 2020, uh, 2023. Where's the money going to come from for the big next big bailout? I'm mean, not talking about a few banks here and there that the U.S. government can deal with and we won't feel the pain. We won't feel it. It'll be there. Your life will be a little bit worse. Every time one of these bailouts happens, your quality of life goes down a little bit. Not so much goes down, but you will have a lower standard of living in the future. Economic growth suffers. Less innovation, less progress, less success in the future. Every time one of these bailouts happen. But at some point, bailouts are impossible. At some point, the U.S. government just can't bail them out. And that is not pretty. Because these institutions are built to be bailed out. They're not built to fail. They're not structurally, particularly banks, are not structurally, I mean, it is a domino effect that can cause massive amounts of damage. So the government won't let them fail. That we know. But it will be forced to print money in order to bail them out. And then you get hyperinflation. And you get a real collapse of the U.S. economy. It also happens probably globally. So I don't know what happens to the dollar relative to other countries. I know what happens here. And we lose whatever happens to the dollar. I mean, the fact that the U.S. government is carrying the kind of debt that it has gives it less flexibility to bail out the economy if and when it wants. And the BRICS are in worse shape than America, always. Always have been, always will be. In much worse shape than America. Anything that happens in America is 10x with the BRICS. So, over the last 40 years, we basically built, I mean, really, I mean, really since the founding of America, the way we established our banks, the way we regulated our banks, the way we constructed our banks, we have built a fragile system. Uh, there's a really good book by an economist from Columbia University by the name of Charles Calamaris called Fragile by Design where he talks about how uh, the American banking system was built to be fragile. Not on purpose, but that's the outcome. And it's never changed. And indeed, he makes the argument, and I would second it and triple it or whatever, that it's only become more fragile by design. Every one of these pieces of regulations like Dodd-Frank makes it more fragile, makes it more likely to be crises, more likely to be crises, and the U.S. government can no longer afford to bail them out. So we're in deep trouble. <laughs> Not that I need to tell you this, but, but we are. We're in deep trouble. I don't know when it happens. I can't predict 
you know, what's going to cause it. But the reality is that this inflationary period we have from 21 to 23 or, or going into 24 now is small fry as compared to the price we would have to pay if this happens to us again in 10 years. It seems like there's a once in a lifetime catastrophe happens every 10 years these days. We have created an economy that's super fragile, that's super dependent on government, that's super dependent on money created out of thin air, an economy that is built on leverage, built on debt, and therefore an economy that in a debt crisis could really collapse, and the cost of bailing it out would be so expensive so outrageous, they would kill the economy anyway. This is not sustainable. It is not doable. And nobody, literally, with the exception of John Cochran talking about it, nobody seems to care. And John has some solutions, which I think are, I'd say, pretty good, um, no, they're not pretty good. They're excellent. They're not as good as I think it should be, but given that we don't live in, 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 in the kind of world that I would like us to live, they're as good as it could get. And he's speaking, he's speaking to nobody. You know, nobody is interested. He, you know, this was published in a journal. He did have an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you can find it. Preventing bailouts is simple, but it isn't easy. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, a highly recommended op-ed. You know, it's, it's, it's really valuable. I'll put the, you know, for those of you who have a Wall Street Journal subscription, I'll put the link in the chat to the op-ed. I'll also put the link in the chat to the PDF of the article for anybody really interested in um, reading the article. I think it's very good, very readable. This is not very uh, difficult. And, um, you know, uh, uh, this is a hugely important issue. And uh, again, this, is, this will determine the fate of the U.S. and the consequence of its government. And yet, it, there doesn't seem to be anybody who actually is, is looking and thinking and wanting to do anything about it. Uh, we're setting ourselves up for this massive economic collapse, massive economic ca ca catastrophe. And uh, the people in charge are dreamwalking. They are pretending everything's fine. They're indeed expanding the state. They're growing the debt. The, you know, and, and, and again, the debt, the more debt the U.S. government has, the less flexible it is in an emergency. And look, the banking system cannot sustain itself without a bailout. That's the reality today, the way it's set up, the way it's built, the way it's created. And a bailout will mean hyperinflation or massive increase in, in interest rates, which will collapse the economy. So no matter how you look, either you let the banks fail and the economy collapses, or you don't let the banks fail and the economy collapses because of high interest rates. And the fact that we have now a soft landing the fact that we haven't had a recession post-COVID is not good news because it only emboldens our politicians and the economists who advise them to think that they are all-powerful, all-able, and can manipulate the system in such ways that will always survive and everything is good. I mean, it's scary stuff, much scarier than woke much scarier than even the demonstrations at the university. So those will go away. That'll disappear. It's not going to have a lasting impact in the United States. This, this, this bailout mentality, the fragility of our banking system, the fragility of our entire economic system that we live in today that's built on massive amounts of debt, this is our way of life ending. This is the kind of thing you would expect an opposition party to really be proposed solutions and encourage change and encourage improvement and work towards all that. 
Instead, all it is is I hate you, you hate me, and everybody agrees with the bailout mentality. Suddenly, uh, the Republican Party today is not interested in reforming the banking system. The Republican Party today is not interested in stabilizing. The Republican Party today is not interested in making the system work any better. And, and while you can make it work better, even without completely privatizing central bank banking and completely privatizing the banking system, you could, you could make it much better. John Cochran has solutions that with a federal, with a, with a Fed, you still make it better. You, you give us breathing room, you, you allow the economy to survive. The current system cannot survive. Right. Cannot survive. And the consequence is the consequence is that we have two political parties with their heads stuck in the sand. They don't want to face the reality and not interested in it. Not not interested in, in dealing with the issue. All right. Um, that is what I have to say about bailouts. Uh, happy to answer your questions. Questions asked on the Super Chat, not questions asked on the chat. So um, use the Super Chat. You know, you should be asking questions about this. This is like important stuff and big stuff and uh, crucial to life. <laughs> you know, you don't want to see another Great Depression. You don't want to see standard of living really collapse. You do not want to live through that. This is an issue that should be bothering you and should be intriguing you in terms of, you know, what's going on, what can be done, how do you solve it, and, um, and so on.